Welcome to Electron Online. Our next example is going to be the simple pendulum. Now here's where Lagrangian is kind of a champion. Even though using the regular equations to find a solution to the simple pen pendulum isn't that hard, you can see where the Lagrangian begins to be quite handy. Well, first of all, what we need to realize here is that we have a pendulum, simple pendulum, meaning there is no mass in the string. All the mass is concentrated at the point mass right here at the bottom. Notice as it swings back and forth, it will gain a certain amount of height. This is the height gain, which of course then translates into potential energy gained by the pendulum. And as it swings back and forth, it will gain speed and lose speed as it goes back and forth, interchanging between potential and kinetic energy. We can express the kinetic energy in terms of kinetic energy is equal to one half. Hmm, let's see, since it's moving in what we call a circular path, we can say it's equal to one half i times omega squared. Of course, i in this case would be mr squared, or in this case, since the length of the pendulum is right here, that's equal to l. Ooh, now we have to be careful. We have an l there, we have an l here. Let's make that a small l so we don't confuse things. So this would be equal to one half times the moment of inertia, which is m times l squared times omega squared. And omega, let's see here, we know that the tangential velocity is equal to r times omega. In this case, that would be l times omega, which means that omega is equal to velocity divided by l. When we plug that in here, we get velocity squared divided by l squared. And notice that the l squares cancel out, and we end up with this is equal to 1 half m tangential velocity squared. That's fine and dandy, but notice that as the direction changes, the velocity will be a summation of an x component and a y component. And then we also need to be able to express the change in the height, which will be a function of theta. That will get quite complicated. Three variables, x, y, and theta. Maybe instead what we can do is express the kinetic energy in terms of theta. And notice that omega is equal to the time derivative, or the derivative with respect to time of theta, which is equal to theta dot. So what I could do is express kinetic energy in generalized coordinates of theta as equal to 1 half i. And instead of omega squared, I could write theta dot squared. And now I have kinetic energy in terms of theta. Now I'm going to find the potential energy in terms of theta as well. Notice that this here would be the full length of the pendulum, L, and then H would be L minus this quantity. And this quantity right here would be equal to L, which is a hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. So this is equal to L times the cosine of theta. And therefore, I can write H as being L minus L times the cosine of theta. Since I have that now, I have height in terms of theta, I can now express the potential energy as equal to mgh, but instead of h, I can write this. I can say this is equal to m times g times the quantity l minus l times the cosine of theta. And finally, if I factor out an l, I can say that the potential energy is equal to mg times the length of the pendulum times the quantity 1 minus the cosine of theta. So now, notice I have the kinetic energy and the potential energy both expressed in terms of theta, and that's going to be the generalized coordinate in our particular equation. Therefore, instead of using x's, we're going to use thetas. We're going to write this equation as the derivative with respect to time of the partial of L with respect to theta dot minus the partial of L with respect to theta equal to zero and that should work just fine. All we have to do now is find these individual components. The partial of L with respect to theta is equal to, well, before I do that, let's back up one step. What I want to do is write L in terms of my components here. So since L is equal to the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, this can then be written as 1 half i times theta dot squared minus the potential energy, which is mg times the length of the pendulum times 1 minus the cosine of theta. And it might be easier to write it like this, 1 half i times theta dot squared, 
minus MgL, and minus times the minus is a plus MgL times the cosine of theta. So now we have three terms in our Lagrangian. Take the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta. That would be this component right here. Now this will go to zero, this will go to zero, and here we have the derivative of the cosine is the negative sign. That would be minus MgL times the sine of theta times d theta d theta. Now we take the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot. Taking the derivative of this, notice that this will go to zero, this will go to zero, and end up with two times a half, which is one times i times theta dot. Now remember that i over here was equal to ml squared, so this can be written as ml squared theta dot. And now I'm ready to take the derivative with respect to time of this, the d dt of the partial of l with respect to theta dot is equal to the derivative of this with respect to time, which makes this become ml squared times theta double dot. So the derivative of theta dot, of course, is theta double dot when we take the derivative with respect to time. Now we're ready to plug this and this in this equation right here. So that means we can say that ml squared theta double dot minus a minus mgl times the sine of theta equal to zero. Hmm, we can probably simplify this a little bit because I have an m here, I have an m here, an l squared, and an l. So when we get rid of the m's and get rid of one of the l's, we end up with l times theta double dot, minus times the minus becomes a plus, and this is g times the sine of theta. Now here what we need to do is realize that a pendulum usually swings to fairly small angles because that's only when the equation somewhat works out, which means that the sine of theta can be approximated by theta. For angles being small, we can say that is true. We can then replace the sine of theta by theta and write this equation as L theta double dot plus G times theta is equal to zero. Next, what we can do is divide both sides of the equation by L, so we get theta double dot plus G over L theta is equal to zero. Now here's the equation of motion for the pendulum, but what we can then realize is that the, this is a differential equation, and the general solution of this is either the sine or the cosine, depending upon the initial conditions. And we can also realize that G over L is actually the frequency or related to the frequency of oscillation, we can say that g over l is equal to omega squared, where omega is equal to the square root of g over l. And that means we can write this as theta double dot plus omega squared theta is equal to zero, which then gives us the equation where theta as a function of time, the angle as a function of time, is equal to some amplitude, well, let's call it a, times the sine or the cosine, I'll just go ahead and use the sine of omega t, omega of course being the square root of g over l. Which means we now have the equation that describes the oscillation and the frequency of the oscillation of a simple pendulum and all that calculated using the Lagrangian. You can see that it works quite nice in using generalized coordinates like this and generalized variables makes it a lot easier to use the Lagrangian and that's how it's done.